So let me ask you a very precise question that has exactly one answer. You can tell by my sarcasm it's not. What is a computer? Calculator. It's a calculator. What else is it? Is it uh, does it necessarily have to be a machine? And in fact, uh, like the earliest computers didn't actually have any electronics or uh, even metal for that matter. So what is the computer? Something that computes. Okay, that seems interesting. So something that computes. Well, computes what? Inputs. Ah, inputs and outputs. Okay, well, what are typical inputs that a computer might have? Well, that's technically the right answer, but like generally, what types of inputs are you used to? Are you used to writing zero, one, enter? So, uh, how many of you read Far Side comics? Oh, you absolutely should. So, there's this um, uh, one panel comic of, uh, of a person at a computer, and it says, Real programmers code in binary, and there are these three buttons, zero, one, enter. <laughs> so real programmers code in binary. So, uh, but really, what types of inputs do computers usually have? Strings. Oh, yeah, strings, but do you work with strings, or do you work with, what things on the computer do you usually use? Keyboard and mouse. Uh, yeah, keyboard and mouse, right. So you have these inputs, right? So you have all kinds of inputs. So like a uh, keyboard is an example. Uh, you might have a mouse. Uh, what other types of inputs might you get? So think less hardware type things. Although there are other hardware ones. Um, yeah, I think sound would be a good one. What else? Power. What's that? Power. Uh, power. But does that come as input usually to a computer? Uh, I guess it could, yeah. So power is another one. Uh, but can an input come over the network? Yeah, certainly. So uh, anything to do with uh, networking? Or, yeah, so anything to do with networking. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, unless someone is dying to add another one. Okay, so... Uh, and so along with inputs come what? Outputs. Okay, great. So there are outputs over here. So we got inputs. What are some outputs that a computer might have? What is the obvious one that you use every single day? Screen. The screen, yeah. Screen, image, yeah, all that stuff. Uh, what other types of outputs might happen? Yeah, sound, <laughs> to, to mirror the other sound one. Uh, what other outputs might we have? Network. Yeah, again, network also. Um, uh, what else could there be? Uh, you could have things sent to a printer. So it's not necessarily just literally on the computer things happen. It could be sent to another device near it and then the output happens there, that could happen. Okay, so uh, I think this is a pretty exhaustive list for, for most everyday things that might occur. So you notice I left a little space in between these two. So what do you think goes in that middle? So something that uh, takes these inputs <laughs> as input and produces these outputs. So does it really make sense for a computer to consume input and not give any output whatsoever? That, that seems kind of useless, right? The, whether, even if it's like written to a file, like the result of a computation written to a file, that is an output of the computation. So it, I can even put that also, so like file in here. So there's got to be something that converts from these inputs over here to these outputs over here. As junior level, I think, uh, programmers, what do you think usually goes there? How do you take inputs to make outputs? So some type of function or in, it's more specifically what? What do you write? Your computer? Programmers. What do you write? Programs. Programs. Okay, great. So 
uh, things that can go in here, so computer uh, programs. Um, could a human be involved in this? Yeah, so it's, it's not necessarily just uh, uh, computer programs or humans or, uh, but much more generally, what happens here? We're computing a function. So a function, remember from 243, takes input to some other domain, some output. So here we're really computing a function uh, or you can think of this as we're doing computation. So there's something that happens here that uh, does this function somehow. It takes these inputs, does some processing, whatever that needs to do, and it produces outputs. Is that clear? Okay. So let's see. Well, could a computer or whatever this thing is, whatever this computational device is, uh, could it have uh, as many inputs as you want? Could it have 10 inputs and 10 outputs? In principle, could it have that? Yeah, I can just add a USB or several USB hubs and p plug them all in, right? Do we really need 10 though? Or could we just get away with one? So I'll actually show you a way that you can say, you can show that I don't need 10 inputs. I can just match them all up into one gigantic input and then to one gigantic output. So think of it this way. So let's just say that we have uh, the keyboard having input, uh, input values in binary, let's say, 0, 1, 1, 0 stuff. The, Let's just do three to make it easy. And then uh, the mouse is one, zero, one, one stuff. And then the sound is uh, zero, zero, one, one stuff. How can I merge these three inputs into one gigantic input? Here's what you do. So I'm gonna switch colors. Anyone else like notability? I like notability. <laughs> Good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first bit of the first input, the keyboard one, and I'm going to write it down here as zero. Then I'm going to switch colors again and go to the first bit of the second input. Okay? So the one right here. And I'm going to write a one here. Switch colors again, let's say green. And then I'm gonna do it like this. And then, so I wrote the, fir the first bit of each of the inputs down. Then I'm gonna take the second bit of each of the inputs uh, down, so like this. So one here, then the zero comes here. And then the uh, second bit of the third input, oops, uh, second bit of the third input goes here. So what we're doing here is we're interleaving the inputs together. So if I wanted to know what the first bit of the sound input is, I just ask for the third bit in the input. Okay, so all we're really doing is we're just, we're just interleaving the inputs together. So do we really need 10 inputs, 10 separate inputs? Or can we get away with one? So I'm not saying whether this is practical or not. So this is actually the one class that's really nice that we can avoid uh, uh, any physical constraints of the universe. So we can just uh, avoid any uh, thing that sounds inefficient and just ask, can we do it at all? So can I do this at all? Yeah, so uh, I can certainly do this. So no issue there. Okay, and then obviously this continues all the way down. So, so therefore we can say, oh, uh, we only have one input. And so we only need to worry about one input here. Can I do the same thing with the outputs? Ah, we, we can interleave the outputs exactly the same way. Ah, so that's kind of cool. 
So what we're so we're going to consider a single input and a single output. So we're abstracting all of the details away. Again, a nice thing about this class, we abstract all the details away. So we're just looking at a single input, single output. Okay. But I'm actually going to make this even easier. You think, okay, this is really easy. This is really dumb. We're only at one input, one output. Ryan, you're going to actually make this easier? I'm actually going to almost eliminate the output entirely. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to have two outputs. Two, sorry, not two outputs. Two possible values to output. So instead of outputting a whole binary string, we're just going to output a single bit only. A zero or a one. Okay? So uh, either a zero or a one. Is this a lot easier now? I think that's pretty easy. So essentially all we're saying here is that we take an input and we say yes or no on that input. Pretty simple. So the reason why I'm making that simplification is that it's much, much easier to analyze this way. It's much easier. So uh, this is the model that we're going to actually look at. Okay. Well, let's see. Well, when we do this computation here, uh, are we going to actually just do the computation raw? Or are we going to uh, have some registers or something to store data? So in a computer, do we have registers to store things like intermediate values? Yeah, so there's, there's some places that we can store stuff. And if, even if we didn't have registers, do we have like a, a storage device that we can store things in? Yeah, so like main memory, and even if we didn't have main memory, God forbid, uh, we have like secondary storage, like solid state, hard drive, whatever. So we have some places that we can store stuff. So, but let me ask you a question. Are computers deterministic? So like if I uh, woke up my machine uh, tomorrow with the exact same uh, configuration, the same memory layout, same everything, and I did the same program, would it do the exact same thing? Yes. yes. So computers are deterministic. Okay. Well, let's see. So if I take this input right here, so I should be able to expect a 0 or 1 every single time, the same output every single time, because the computer is deterministic. Cool. Well, let's see. Could I, let's extend that a little further. Suppose that instead of just waking up my machine, I wake this machine up in the middle of a computation. So I've already had a program going for, say, six weeks, and I freeze somehow my computer, and then a month later, I wake up my computer again in the exact same state, literally the same memory layout as it was before. Would it continue doing exactly what it would have done? Yeah, because computers are deterministic. So for that reason, we can think of the memory layout as something that can be stored or a state of the computer. So whatever the memory layout of my computer is, it's some layout of bits, but we can think of that as a single state of the computer. And if I wake up the computer in the exact same state, it'll do the exact same thing from that state no matter when I do it. Okay? So we can think of a memory layout of computers to be uh, states. Okay, so the memory layout of a computer is a state. How much time do I have? I have five minutes, okay. So uh, memory layout of computers are states. Okay, so obviously what's gonna happen is we have a state, so let's just say we're in a current state right now, some memory configuration, and we do one instruction of the computer, some kind of execution, one step, it, am I going to get to some other state of the computer? Yeah, so if I 
uh, change uh, the value in a register, that's going to change some bits. Or it might not actually change things. But something's going to happen, and the result of that is going to be a state. So what we need to do if we're going to analyze this is we've we got to look at states of our computer and relate them together somehow. There's some kind of relation between the states of a computer. Well, let's see. Let's just say that we have a particular state that we're looking at. Could it be that, uh, uh, let's just say that if we're in this state, we could output one right now. Say, say yes on this input. Let's just say that we are in one of those states. Could the computer carry on other computations after that point, even though we could say one or zero? Could the computer just carry on and then eventually say yes or no at some point later? Yeah. So some states we should mark as one states and some zero states as um, uh, other states. So what will happen is if we do our computation, end up in some memory configuration, some state, we have identified each of the states with either 0 or 1. We said this state is a 0 state, or this state is a 1 state, this state is a 0 state. And if we end up in that 1 state, and the com computation's all done, then we say 1 on that input, or yes on that input. If we end up in one of the 0 states, we say no on that input, or 0. So we got to set... Uh, each of the states to be uh, zero or or one states. But there's something uh, else we need to look at uh, if that is, that isn't already enough. Well, when I start up my computer, does it start in the exact same uh, state every single time? Yes. It, so, uh, it, so I know, ignoring secondary storage. Think of just main memory here. So do we uh, start up in the exact same start state every single time, same memory configuration every single time we wake the computer? Yes, every single time. So we got to identify one of the states to start with. So we got to uh, set one of the states to be a start state. So there's one state that is going to be uh, labeled as a start state, and every state uh, that we're going to look at is either going to be a no state or a yes state. Okay? I think that's long enough. Let's take a five-minute break.